you so much, Seiko. Um, I emailed Seiko in July, a lot of you. I was like, hey, we have this idea. We did this collaboration in 2017 with the museum. Uh, a similar panel. Bella was on the panel, who's here tonight, uh, and said, let's try to do this again. We've launched these two books. Um, art is incredible, as you'll see throughout the night over here. Uh, and Siseko said yes. So thank you so much to Siseko for making all of this happen, uh, as well as the amazing team at the museum, um, Toto, Storm, Anissa, Jason, Lucius, Noor, Este, everybody. It's just been incredible to see this come together, and we're so very appreciative. Um, and for all of our journalists coming from all over the continent, to be able to look at this space, um, have an incredible tour, led by the team specifically focusing on queer concepts has just been so wonderful um, and really jives with what we're trying to do. So, so let's please give a round of applause to them. So we've gathered you all here today to celebrate. Um, it's the first time in Cape Town that we're actually able to celebrate the launch of two books hopes and dreams that sound like yours, and courage to share. Uh, and we're really here to celebrate, so I'm very strict that this will end at seven and there will be drinks and there will be food, we will have fun. Um, everyone, as they arrived, got a book. You should have got the book. If not, please please grab one when we're done. And Deborah had a fun idea to, to make a game. I'll, I'll introduce more people and think more people in a second. Um, but inside, you should have a few postcards. Um, this year, there were 29 pieces of art uh, that I'll we'll be scrolling through tonight. This is last year's, we're actually just starting last year's, and then we'll get to Courage to Share. And Courage to Share, so find a postcard you love, uh, swap it. Like, let's make these trading cards, meet someone new, um, it'll be fun. Yeah. So, so before we dive into the actual discussion of the book, uh, we do have a few more important thank yous. Lisa Leno, who's in the room tonight, um, and also Siseko, for setting up this art. It's actually on display at the Lisa Leno Gallery at the Old Castle Brewery um, from today until November 11th. So please go and check out that incredible space. There's also amazing, other amazing artwork there. Um, as Siseko said, our caterers who've worked with us now, I think, since 2016, the team at 6 Spin Street, you'll definitely be delighted by what they have in store for us. Um, and then all of our partners. So, to actually get these books off the ground, um, it was Paula, it was Taboo, it was over 100 people. It was everyone on this panel, it was several people in this room, as illustrators, as um, copy editors, as proofreaders, as designers, um, as many other things that I'm probably not remembering. So, long story short, thank you. And these are heartfelt thank yous. This isn't like, procedural thank yous. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for everyone here today. So, we're here today, and it's actually day one of a four-day workshop for journalists covering specifically the topic of sexual, sexual and gender diversity and religion. So there's 19 journalists from all over the continent. Um, we also have many activists in the room, um, mostly from Cape Town, but also from Joburg, from around, um, from other countries. Zimbabwe, I know, just like looking around the room. Um, and it's time to bring these two groups together to actually have discussions. So, Taboo Media, the organization I work for, and I'll stop talking in a second, uh, has always worked with journalists, and now we're working with activists. And the idea was to do one of these regional workshops that we're doing with journalists now for activists in 2021. But then COVID happened. So we had great plans, we were all going to come to Cape Town, as we've done the past few years, meet with journalists, do workshops on media engagement, but we couldn't. So we did what everyone did, we moved to Zoom, and we still did it. But then, because we had budget saved up, that we couldn't spend on flights, that we couldn't spend on hotels, we thought, how can we put this to good use? We've all been locked in our homes, it was January 2021 at this point, and we had the idea, why not um, make it sort of a storytelling workshop in addition? So near the end of the week, it was a week-long workshop, 
we sort of weren't still telling, done telling our stories. We were still kind of meeting. It was virtual. We didn't have all these side chats. And we decided to write our stories. The 20-some necklaces that were part of that first workout. They were incredible. Gala, the Aaron will talk about what they do in a moment, was like, oh, why don't we end? Or why don't we illustrate this? And we're like, that's a cool idea. Uh, and then it just snowballed from there. So the two anthologies now have 50 stories from, I think, nearly 30 countries. Um, 20 plus illustrators, um, and they capture as many of the themes we'll talk about tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of parched, so I think it's time I hand the microphone over. Um, on the panel, I will do quick introductions. Um, starting on my left, one of our amazing illustrators from the very first uh, edition, Larry Manyama, who also goes by that art kid, Larry. Yeah. Um, is a creative digital storyteller based here in Cape Town uh, and will talk us through some of the processes and themes that uh, she explores in her work, particularly in, is it four illustrations you've done for the anthology? Yeah. In the four, four of the illustrations for the anthology, one of which is here um, and several you'll see cycling through uh, and two you have in your book. So Larry will speak about that. Karen who's like my partner in crime, everything, getting these off the ground. Um, in addition to Deborah from Taboo Media, like the, my co-director there, and Siska, who's been incredible, and like Siska Smith, who's just done so much in terms of the logistics. Um, Karen will talk about Gala's, Gala's role. Um, Zoe, one of our storytellers, one of the very first story in the first anthology. Um, tell us a bit about her story. Um, an amazing activist um, with gender dynamics. And then Kevin Machiro, a journalist, storyteller, fiction, nonfiction, person of all traits. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to discuss this. So I think I've had the mic long enough. Um, I would love to hear, why don't we start with Zoe, um, your story. Tell us your story, uh, not read us your story, but Tell us why you wrote your story, what this process meant for you, and how you how you went about it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, thank you for applying for the opportunity. And thank you so much for making time to join us this evening. Um, the work that we do is surrounded by a contribution, so I just wanted to extend my gratitude. So my name is Zoe Ahmed. I work here at the Regional Advocate Office of Gender Dynamics based in Zimbabwe. So prior, before I moved to in 2019, I was engaged with the, with the training. So the training it took us a, a, a couple of days, and then after the days, we were tasked to write a story. Stories that will not change. So in the process, I remember I submitted two stories, but they didn't make impact for me as the, the writer. And understanding, I didn't want to, I felt like I didn't do justice within those two pieces that I wrote, because um, being an activist and coming from the point of um, marginalization, I wanted to write something that speaks to the community, beyond the speaking to me, but something that my fellow trans bodies can relate into. And then um, after weeks, um, I said to Ryan, no, take out the stories, I'm writing one. And then when I was in the process of writing this um, story, I reflected on my self's journey as a transgender woman accessing hormonal therapy in Zimbabwe. What does that mean? And bearing in mind that was the time of COVID, there was no access. And working over the years, I've built this image of being non healthy, but then I couldn't access um, $100 medication, right, per month. So I, I was so embarrassed to narrate all this, to say, oh, I'll be ashamed from the community, or I'll target my image. But then I was, I was, I was confident because the narrative didn't speak to me um, alone, it speak to broader community. And that's for me when um, I wrote the story, I was like, do you think this is good? Fine, fine, okay, this is the best. 
<laughs> so we, we went on with the story. Um, during the publication, so the story married to where I'm coming from. I embraced um, coming from rural background in Zimbabwe and later moved into the city to access um, employment and education. However, I still face numerous challenges within the city in terms of accessibility of services. And then that's when it brought me to write the article, looking around um, how are the policies and the systems are structured in countries. They uh, marginalize certain groups or they do not access due to economic health sustainabilities in the country. So the story is looking around that narrative around accessibility, as well as um, understanding that my gender identity is not defined by education. But it's defined by my own perspective as a human being. Thank you. <laughs> it's defined by my own understanding as a human being to say if I identify as a trans woman, I can be a human being without medication. Because I've existed the, the entire life without medication, but I still conform as a, a transgender woman. What does that mean whenever I'm for instance, medication is not given to me as a trans body. Does that take away my identity? It doesn't. So the story was looking around the embodiment of my self-worth as a person and understanding that we don't need to be defined by medical practices or uh, economical circumstances. And then when we, we published the story, the, 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 the feedback was very impactful because um, I began to understand that the, the same situation that I was facing is other African countries they're facing, trans bodies, around how the systems or the structures they no access to to these services. So the story is highlighting um, a, a bit of narrative of where I'm coming from and to the point of my difficulties during lockdown. And understanding, I think the important part is about around identity and how I interpreted my own identity to say, I don't need to be defined by community or society. I need to conform with my own standards and my own ability in terms of my thinking and realign that with my daily level. Thank you. Thank you. I think when we spoke as well about the storytelling process, you, you just described some of the benefits of it was for you. Um, can you talk a bit about that? So many of the storytellers have described what it's like to actually put your experience into words and to create that narrative. What has that meant for you in that sense? I think prior before uh, the words, I was suffering with mental disorder at the time, and um, I had so much internalized um, issues that I didn't speak about. So when I was in the process of writing, that's why I read about three um, stories, and I felt like they didn't know me. And when I wrote this um, a story, it felt like a liberation of uh, my mental well-being and being able to pin down um, my ideas into a paper, and then later being published. For me, it was a healing come through. So that process, because I, it was very a tough process for me to, to write, what is the issue? What's, what is it I'm facing? Because I, I was just afraid of being conservative around what people will say around the article. So for me, it was a healing process. So, um, Karen, you, as we start, start talking about bridging the storytellers to the artists, um, can you tell us about how we went about that and, and what, what our thoughts are there? Um, yeah. Do you know? um, yeah, so when uh, when Ryan approached us rather um, with with uh, this um, proposal of, of the stories, and actually I think it was Zoe's story that he shared with us, which um, we think was really moving and passionate, but um, was that uh, illustrations can also kind of interpret and bring to life. Um, some of the, those narrations, and, and um, you know, we, we, we've recently just uh, been, um, we've recently just illustrated a, a, an article about uh, queer uh, 
experiences of how people have been in lockdown. Um, and, and, and that, that kind of dimension just changed the reading experience. Um, yeah, and, 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 and broadly, the, the storytelling, um, you know, is you kind of like broadly you know of its kind of um, ability to allow audiences to empathize with, with the authors or the characters that are being shared. And I think that that illustrative dimension allows for an extra, extra kind of level of that. So let's talk to one of the illustrators. So we approached you and one of you decided to join this project. <laughs> we were just like, we found this idea. Do you remember what that conversation was like? And um, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then um, you approached me on Instagram and uh, said, hey, we're doing a project. We'd love you to join. And then obviously had the email. And I just thought, wow, I'd never thought about what my art would look like in the activist conversation that also includes me and my university. And um, yeah, I just thought what a wonderful opportunity to, to join in and also extend myself to the country in that way. So, just, yeah. Can you tell us about uh, one piece in particular, maybe the story behind this one? And, uh, Dave, if you remember David's story and, and then how you decided to illustrate it. Yeah, so. Um, my, with David's story, uh, he touched base on uh, you know themes around community and found family in the community, and uh, he was one of the original founders for um, an LGBT plus activism uh, community group, one of the first in Ghana that um, you know was this shining moment for all queer yeah, women just like coming together and celebrating their individuality and themselves. And, um, they received a lot of Lash, like, lash out and backlash, thank you, um, from the larger community, the conservative community, and uh, you know, they're still fighting for that space to be held open and to exist. And I felt, you know, when I was illustrating it, I always try my best not to represent what I think someone is going through, but rather what that made me feel and how I could um, represent that in the colors and lines that inspired me in my work. And, yeah, I thought of how this ambiguous space, what it means to create a family, what that feels like, and for that to be stripped away and taken from you with no real premise or from people who already have a solid foundation that is supported by this external reality. And I feel that with myself being a spiritual healer, storyteller, visual artist, my gift is quite ambiguous, but I often am asked, how do you know how to do that? Where does that come from? And I feel that's the same thing that the life that's in us. And um, when I was designing those three figures, I imagined the space, the ambiguous spiritual space where that energy and that thought comes from. So imagine this portal that one could access at any point that despite in our physical realms, how people can decide whether something's real or not, that it, it always exists, it always makes us up even in I actually remember um, you sent an early sketch of that, and it, it was an early sketch that's from really this beautiful thing. It was beautiful at first, but I remember seeing the, the, the figure at the top and us having a conversation. I was like, what is this exactly? And then you explained it, and I was like, okay, now I get it. <laughs> but at first I would know it's so beautiful. Um, and also, in the book that you have in front of you, uh, there is art is also on page 115. Story, the, the story to spoke about the transition of death and the death of identity. And I imagined what this beautiful transitional space would look like. And I imagined this field of white flowers and these forms sort of growing in that. That I imagined that um, if someone in this real world sort of decided, you know what, I'm going to stand, I'm ready to, to be seen, that a flower sort of forms a body and sort of lives a second life in this, this space and that that contributes further to. Know, um, the future movement, like people growing, and yeah, I I love playing with this idea of a world that we are familiar with in terms of you know, 
that the body is in the prison and conceptualize that, but that sort of just get lost in the possibility of that being real to you and existing only for you and also for others. Yeah, go ahead. Jackie as well. I think uh, because the story was originally written in French, um, and at that time when you sent it to me, to Larry, um, we hadn't had a translate, um, we hadn't translated it, and, and so we'd send you the French version and yeah. then just say translate it on, on, a, <laughs> on, on Google or, or whatever. <laughs> and I think, that, I think because of Larry's particular kind of, of ways of interpreting um, the stories and, and uh, kind of, it worked in your favor, yeah. you know, because it's, it's not this kind of very literal in, um, representation of the story, it's a very interpretive, and I think that that level of translation <laughs> is kind of the That's a great, actually, transition. We've been talking about hopes and dreams, the first book, quite a bit, uh, but a good transition to Courage to Share, so that's the second, uh, second volume of the anthology. And as Karen mentioned, um, that particular story from Harry, a pseudonym of someone in Madagascar, uh, was originally written in French, as were four other stories. And in Courage to Share, there are, there are 28 stories, um, four of which were originally written in French, but all of them in the book are translated into English and French. Um, and basically, once we did Hopes and Dreams, uh, we got a lot of feedback that these stories are great, but to have it in more languages. So for the second anthology, um, we did that and we also brought in some mentor editors to, uh, because we were no longer just making it up as we went, which is what the first volume was. Uh, well, let's do this more strategically. Um, so Kevin was one of our mentor editors um, who came in for the workshop uh, and edited six, six stories. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us about why you, well, first of all, what that process was like, working with the storytellers, uh, why you wanted to get involved in your project? Um, it, we, it was quite an amazing group that we had. So we were, when people kept saying yes, we were like, wow, well, these are some <laughs> incredible, uh, incredible mentors we had. Uh, but yeah, why you, why you decided to get involved? Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. For me, it was just an amazing opportunity to be part of a process which I consider crucial at this continent, in the continent at this point in time, to more African stories. You know, to more African stories from about queerness. You know, so this was a great opportunity to get involved. We worked with Brian before, and um, they were, when you send the email, I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm a storyteller, uh, and I think it is. In, I'll just put in my own uh, journey here. When I came into my own skin and was comfortable with my, with my sexuality, I would never read an African story about being queer. And this was way back, and I didn't think we were allowed to be queer. You know, so the stories I read were by 19, not 19, actually, 2000 and something. <laughs> <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> I'll be honest, 2006, I just come into my own. And the first book I read about black queer love was by Michael Randall in Paris. I read everything because I didn't think it was possible. Many years on, to be part of this project where I'm reading about African queer love, African stories, was so satisfying, was just so gratifying in knowing that the work is continuing. And for me, the reason why the work that I do is so that people don't feel alone and I felt alone and to be part of a story, to be part of a project where I know I'm helping someone else not feel alone, where there are a lot more words, there are a lot more identities, there's a lot more color to that is an honor to be part of it. So we, we had that initial meeting, uh, Brian introduced me to, to the team uh, and it was just a question of back and forth, people sent the initial drafts. And initially, people were really cagey, you know? Um, and as a writer and a my journey as a person, as a human being, to more vulnerability, to more authenticity. And I think for me, that was what I did. And I'm really grateful for the team who did that. And I was just excited for the fact that there were contributions from this one team. Someone didn't have me, wow, 
you know, um, countries like Cameroon as well, you know, people from northern Nigeria, and these were people who did grow up in big cities, you know, um, that rural African queer story, you know, and that's what we need. And I'm just really excited that Courage to Share is also in French, because there is a gap in content coming up from, from Anglophone versus other forms, you know, Francophone and also forth. And the fact that this might be doing a lot of work, that this can go to other countries, to other stories, to other individuals, so that they know that also. There's the language and the regional things that are important to me. So we've done two volumes. Uh, plans to do two more, and then to do language-specific versions in Kiswahili, Portuguese, and Arabic. Um, we'll see we've changed the subtitle from Stories of Queer Activism in Sub-Saharan Africa to Queer Activism in Africa. Um, the second volume doesn't actually have any North African stories, but it's a challenge to ourselves to make sure that those are included going forward. Um, yeah, so I think what you touched on in terms of getting the stories out, the impact that can have. Carrie, can you talk about what Gola's done to get the books out um, to schools and the distribution? Yeah, um, so uh, Gallery, we uh, have a education program. It's mainly tertiary focused, but only do it in schools as well. And um, yeah, and, and so I think just what it's is whatever spaces we end up in working in, um, presenting in, organizations that we meet along the way, we just, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think even when we printed, I think we were a bit taken aback and we were like, as many as possible, we were like 800 copies. That's also the budget question. <laughs> I know, I know, um, but, but yeah, it was, it was like 800 copies and, and, and it was just about kind of, Bringing it to to every space that we, we go to and, and having it come because I mean I think it was under 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 a year that we that we had all of the articles disappear. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I just want everyone to look at the Zoe's. This is the illustration of Zoe's oh, story because okay. uh, I want to ask Zoe about this in a minute, and it's on this loop. So I just want to make sure everyone's up. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, you were talking about the distribution. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, and, and and for the most part, like I think it's like at, at um, conference as well, like international activists come through um, when we try. We also try really hard to to like hand out at those so that um, so that publication can also cross borders. Unfortunately, I think there's uh, distribution like posting it across the, the, uh, on, on the continent can be, can be quite tough, especially queer content. Um, a lot of a lot of um, customs can be quite suspicious of it, especially if it's in in in, in bulk or in, in all that kind of that, and it also ends up like, being kind of expensive. So, um, so that is distribution is quite is quite a big challenge. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that. <laughs> and one thing we've done, which I I really love that we do with Stephen and then all this homework for this too, is everything that's produced is in the Creative Commons. So rather than it being copy, copyrighted, um, anyone can download it for free from our websites. Um, that includes the art, the stories, and can reshare them. Well, it's a share alike license, is the license we use. Um, but it's really to get the, the stories out and the art out to, to, to ever, as many people as possible. So we just saw, so we talked about, there you spoke about illustrating a story that you that you read. Um, and we all just saw um, Amina Gimba is the artist's name, who illustrated that beautiful um, blue image of Zoe's story. So what was the process like when you saw how your story had been illustrated? Like what did you think? Like what was that experience like? I think I was um, surprised because I have seen the picture in the, in the, the face in my head, so I was like, oh wow, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> but well, the, the interpretation of illustration, looking how um, it was breathtaking, because I'm like, can you break the narrative into pictures or into 
um, illustrations. I believe that the process of shooting and arrangements. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I can say. It really, it really looked like me. <laughs> that's the first thing you said to me. You're like, wow, that is so nice. Yeah. <laughs> it felt like someone was drawing me. <laughs> so I think that's, I, I was surprised and being humbled by the, the opportunity to be put in illustration in a minority, um, translating into illustration. Because illustration um, is got different um, particles that speak around um, health, that speak around doubt as a sign of hope. So there are so many creativity that we put into the illustration that we're now to And uh, the, the visual style, Karen, at the beginning we sort of thought we would go with sort of vector illustrations to start with, um, to try to get a unified theme, um, or just like a visual identity, I guess. Um, but this year we sort of expanded, there was a line of cut, and we'll have to all discuss as a group how the visual identity changes from the forward. Um, but I mean, uh, uh, in the first, in the Hopes and Dreams, as the slide said, we were even not even doing it, um, we did initially just kind of sought out a few illustrators, you know, kind of reached out to people in, in our own networks for recognition and stuff. And then when this, with the second Courage to Share, we, we put out a call, made it a bit more official, and we also translated that into French and in Portuguese so that we could get a, a broader diversity of. of um, Illustrations and, and the kinds of illustrations also came back a lot more diverse. So um, yeah, I think it was also kind of us going with the with the flow as well. And 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 I think that a lot of illustrators have, have, have expressed a lot of uh, interest in being part of the, of the project. At, yeah, that you know sometimes the the, the enthusiasm is, is, is as as exciting as the as the illustrations. Well, I see we have nine minutes, eight minutes now, which is seven, I think I've managed to be cut off. Um, should, we, should we take some questions from the, from the audience? Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, amazing narratives and stories to hear. Uh, my question is to Kevin. Uh, as part of your role uh, being an editor for the second version, what were some of the major challenges that you encountered when you came to several stories supplied and how do you narrate them in a way that uh, reflects all the basic principles of journalism? Thank you. In the initial drafts, there was a lot of NGO speak, to be honest. A lot of terms and abbreviations, and people weren't writing those stories for themselves. And there was, there, was a, there was a pattern, you know, and there was almost a bit of chest thumping. People saying, I'm the executive director, I did this and comms and everything, you know, and, and just that was it. You know, tell me, but, but tell me about you, tell me about growing up, where you were, who were the people who surrounded you, what was school like. And eventually, that was, that was it. Um, just, I think if you're involved in activism quite a bit, you forget the language of the soul and speak the language of the donor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one that pays. Yeah. <laughs> but the one that fires the soul yeah. is in the language of the heart. Mm. So I think it was getting people to speak the language of the heart and to see value in their story. Um, yeah, you need to give me a mic because I'm loud enough. Um, I think where I stand is just in appreciation for Brian and everyone on the panel. Um, I had a friend um, who contributed to an anthology, a non-binary person, um, and at the beginning of the lockdown, they took their life. And because of lockdown, I couldn't travel to Botswana for the burial. The memorial was done on Facebook, so it was really painful. And every time I open the book and I see illustrations and I see what they've written and I read the words they wrote, 
becomes for me a re reliving that event. And and I just want to say that when we capture those stories in images, in writing, in making sure that we are contributing, it's keeping that memory alive. And I really appreciate that. Everyone in the panel to Brian, may we never lose that passion of creating our own life. Mine is not so much a question, it's um, also appreciation. And uh, I came out when I was 16 years old in Zimbabwe. And uh, that was one of the hardest things that I could have ever done to myself. Um, sorry. And to sit here and see people um, from all these countries that reminded me of home and also to see people that are from home is a very emotional experience and it's, uh, it's almost a spiritual experience for me because what we've forgotten about when we tell our stories and then we start to try and speak to uh, our homelands where we come from is we forget the aspect that we are spiritual beings as well and that the soul is this indestructible thing that is in this body that encases us and I'm walking that path now where I'm just appreciative of meeting people that are making a difference for themselves or thinking they're doing it for themselves but they're doing it for the 16 year old who still is coming out in that landscape. So thank you, really appreciate it. So, you mentioned that you were a bit hesitant with telling your story. Um, I just want to find out what gave you the courage to tell your story as it was, and to just be able to write that down and share it with basically the entire world. so much um there are words that often would say that i come i come in one but in ten thousand and the words they interpret to say in every opportunity that we get we should be reminded of the next generation i come from where um the narrative of being lgbti transgender is not documented the issues are not seen or people, they are afraid to be themselves because of um, social, um, environmental context. So for me, I was given the opportunity to set an inspiration for a younger trans person as well as an older person who aspires to be a trans boy. And so for me, when I wrote the first um, two articles, they were high level, they were speaking around the things that we do within the movement around activism, but they didn't speak to my soul. It was to say, I wanted something that I was speaking with, something that I can share with people. Um, beyond how I look like um, when we meet in spaces, I wanted to be right about myself. So when I, I position myself in the writing, that's when I say, let me write the narrative that will change um, people. Hi. From Hills of Living Life. But I'll Um my question is really for Brian and Karen. Like in in the life of an LGBTQIA person, we become so accustomed to pain and um, and, and suffering that we do become somewhat desensitized. And my question to you is in either one of the anthologies, what was the story that surprised you in how it impacted you personally from reading it? 
is um, the goddess queer. And that, and that's, that also kind of sticks with me because um, uh, Gala does a, has a queer history tour in, in Lugar and Jogo. And one of the stops on that, on that walking tour is, is, a, is a queer being and going to be a church, a queer church. And um, it's, it's above or below a bar. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the church itself is there on the way, but um, on, on, the, on, the, on the walk, on the, on the tour, um, when Hopes and Dreams came out, um, um, our, our director, Emil started reading the, the poem, My God is Queer, at the, at the ch- what used to be the church. I think that, you know, bringing stories to and, and from different spaces and inserting them in different ways is, is quite impactful, you know, like, you know and, and, and allowing stories to kind of continue to live in different ways and then be relevant at different times and different spaces and activate different yeah. I'll also just say, so you don't think we rank them, the English rank them over our friends. Actually, the very last one, correct to share, Grace of Kumu's I Wear My Colors of Pride, uh, also really I mean, currently in English and French, practice her French. But it talks about her basically coming out to her family um, around uh, very significant moment in her life and the impact that that on her children. So, yeah, how that, how that came to be. Any final thoughts, I think, from our panelists? And then, please, let's keep the conversation and the questions flowing as the drinks flow. Thank you. This has been you know, this moment I've been a little nervous, but I'm so happy to see everyone I'm like very close to my but it is impactful to see people alike and visually alike and you know, connecting um, alike just be together, sharing together and growing together. I mean, there's something beautiful about it. I hope it's not the world because I just feel like I'm gonna wake up and it's not happening, but it is. And you guys made that happen and I'm so honored to be part of the show. So. Queer activists' work 
is, is, is really amazing and important because oftentimes it's, it's very thankless, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you're, like, you're pushing against a, a, a brick wall that you know might never change. And sometimes people you know, never see that change happening in, in, in their countries and stuff. So I think it's about highlighting that work and those stories and those lives. And then it's also about reading them and, um, and then seeing yourself. something there about <laughs> <laughs> But we'll, um, I'd like to extend this gratitude to my friends who came and support me and colleagues and who appreciate the solidarity. <laughs> yeah, but I think beyond all, I think we need to prioritize our own our well being. And we live in a stage where being vulnerable is a shame. And accessing mental health services is an embarrassment. And that's why sometimes we have internalized um, disorder that we start up behind the scenes. Um, and later on, we take our lives. So I just want us to encourage everyone in the room that it is okay not to be okay. And it's part of healing, and you need to find the healing mechanism and understand what healing can hold to you in your own ways. So I just want us, um, when we leave this room, you take your whole mental health thing and find healing in your own ways. Thank you so much. Um, share this book. <coughs> share this book quietly. If you know public universities that will take it in the libraries, put it in there. Mm. If you know private universities that are willing or the good librarians, share this book. Because these books are being used, even if people are critical of us, people are using it for research. Mm. You know, so please get this book into libraries, get them into coffee shops, and to more stories. And and we're we're living in a time we've just had a new president and and people are really iffy about how it's going to impact on Kenya and then people are really iffy about how to deal with the LGBTQ community. They are banning the obvious, but they're not banning books. So to more books, to more stories, because they're not reading them. Yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. they're after the likes and the retweets, but they're not after the pages. Yeah. So to more books, to more stories. I met, um, uh, she. A Somali writer, and she's done her first book in Somali. So the stories are there, and I look forward to more to, to, to more stories like this in various languages across the continent, because it is important. We're still seeing young people come out; and they're finding themselves a lot faster and a lot easier than when we did. But they also know that there is a path, and that path has been made has already been laid for them. Just to make their language easier, to more stories, to more words. Let's have some fun. More soft life as queer Africans. Thank you, Kevin. So, Aaron, sorry. Thank you, all of us. Tabroom team, Gala team and ultimately all the authors, all the illustrators, which this entire book is. It's their stories, the illustrations are theirs, they are ours collectively. Uh, that's what the Creative Commons ethos is all about. So as Kevin said, please share. And thank you so much for being here. Now let's celebrate.